Hi guys, I'm Mickey I'm from the Woodcraft Folk. Hi, I'm Evelyn. I'm from the Slovenia Balkan Union. And I'm Hebas from Ajiali with Movement. Love it. And, the, and today our first interviewee is Pierre. Hi, so my name is Pia and uh, I'm also from the Slovenian Falcon Youth Union, but today or during this week, uh, I'm actually a representative of IFMSCI, so the International Falcon Movement Socialist Educational International. And yes, that is international two times, we just think it's so important to be all we had it with in our name, two times. <laughs> so how did you get into IFM? Uh, for me, it was a really um, kind of a funny story. So uh, I'm actually one of the founding members of our organization. And once we started working, we very quickly found out about ISN through other member organizations and decided, hey, this is something really cool. We really want to be in an international uh, umbrella movement. And we got in. So since our organization has been in ISN, so have I. And I've gone to ICs, I've gone to congresses, I've been part of projects that IFM has put together, both as a participant and as a teamer. And I have to say, so looking back at it, it's been about seven years, I think. Yeah, a lot of time, I know. <laughs> nice. So what, what was, what's your role in IFM? Um, well, I, in IFM, for some time, I was the contact point from the, for the Slovenian Falcon Union, so I was the international secretary of our organization. And now I'm mostly part of the pool of trainers. So uh, whenever IFM is looking for trainers, teamers, facilitators, however you want to call it, I am also one of the people that they go, they, they contact and go like, hey, we have this project, do you have the time? Uh, would you be willing to apply? Sometimes I find the call and apply. Uh, and it goes on from there. So that's my current role in IFM. You know, and at the moment you're a team around the uh, choosing and recent project. Are you able to explain a bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the choosing anti-racism uh, or the radical reorientation of our consciousness as a pre-part project. And this is actually that now we are in Weida and this is the second part of the project. I was also there for the first one, which took place in Finland. And mostly the project is just about helping young people understand and express their views on racism and actually get to know how to be anti-racist. So not just to passively not be racist, but to actually be anti-racist. So take a stance against racism, call it out, learn how it, how it works, learn uh, how it's a part of our structures, of our systems, act against that. Yeah. And the second part is actually a training for trainers of some sort. So the yeah, people who are part of this project or part of this phase of the project are now learning what they can do so what kind of activities they can do on the topic they're also making uh, things like for example this podcast here we're also do dealing with art how art can help us be anti-racist and so on basically i will on this project uh, we talk a lot about being an ally uh, I was wondering if you could show us any other techniques or examples of people being an ally. Exactly. So we talked quite a bit about being an ally already in the first part and the second <laughs> one. And uh, we actually, for the first part, built, sort of built uh, an ally. So what kind of characteristic an ally that has to have, how they should act. And mostly what we talked about is, like, the most important thing is to be an active bystander and to listen. So an active bystander is somebody that takes action. If you see something happening, you have multiple tools and you also learned about those, how to prevent that action. It could either be just jumping into a conversation and saying, hey, this isn't right, trying to educate a person. It could be removing the person who is being insulted in some way out and providing a safe space for them so they can, you know, uh, tell you what happened. Uh, they tell you what they need things like that and this is also where the active listening part comes in it's important to know that as an ally you're not the person who's dictating what happened mm -hmm. you're there to help you're there to listen the person who was insulted or the person who had something racist happen to them who was accused of whatever it was by a racist person or it happened inside of a institution or assisted they're the ones that have to you know tell you i i would like this to happen they're the ones that uh, dictate how it infected them. You can't put things into their mouths. You can't say, oh, okay, we'll do this and this now. You're there to provide support. Mm -hmm. So that's what being an ally is. But we also talked about, and I think it's important to point out that being an ally sometimes means to take action in a, in a more uh, 
covert way. So it might, it might not just be jumping into a conversation. It could be getting somebody else. It could be calling the police. It could be taking a video and using that. Or it could be afterwards, like if the situation is dangerous, there are other, other tools that you can use to help other than putting yourself into danger or escalating the situation. So we also talked about tools and methods to de-escalate, how to help, where to find help, uh, things like that. Yeah. Do you ever think any time because of you or like witnessing someone being an idol like in a successful way mm -hmm. went out and escalate the situation? Mm -hmm. So I have to say that my experience uh, with being an ally is a bit limited due to the fact that I come from a country which is predominantly white. Of course, it still sometimes happens, uh, but my experiences of being an ally would mostly be treated to cases of sexual harassment or sexual assault. That being said, I do know of some examples of where being an ally uh, in terms of anti-racism also happened and it was successful. There is this in Slovenia, in the, the capital of it, in Ljubljana, there's a place called Mitilkova. And it's kind of a place uh, for the alternative side of art, of culture. Uh, there's clubs, there's, there's these kind of art galleries, but very casually owned, very for the people, by the people, that kind of thing. And sometimes when you're having events there, there, sometimes people show up with the intent of being either racist or just insulting. And there was this case where uh, it was kind of an event for refugees who have come during the migration. I say crisis because it's called like that in the media, but we don't see it as that. So during that, there was an event for kind of a mingle event. So getting to know each other, people who have escaped from conflict situations in their own countries, and stayed in Slovenia, helping mingle kind of an event to, to thank all the volunteers to show that people are people, right? No matter where you come from, what the language you speak, what color your skin is, people are people. And of course, some people showed up uh, and started like, um, of course, insulting people, throwing racist slurs around. And in that case, we could, you know, we could clearly see that those people were there to incite violence. Their point was to come there, get a reaction so that they can use it then, or the media could use it then as show, look, these people can find that they don't belong here. So in that case, most of us uh, saw this and decided that the only way to act is to not react to that. So we called the police, the police came, and it was an organized event. It was, we did everything by the book, or the organizers did everything by the book. So when the police came, uh, they escorted or arrested some of the, um, let's say protesters, but not protesting for the right causes and escorted them out. So in that case, it was very successful that people kept their heads about them. They were calm. They saw, okay, their point is to have chaos here and not allow them to have that. So calling the police, reacting in a very uh, calm way, having everything prepared uh, when the police arrived and go like, this is what happened. We have the footage. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, that was a very successful way of showing how to be an ally. Yeah, like, that's like the main thing that is very important is staying calm. Because I've seen a lot of situations where some more in their senior degree and they can rush headfirst and not do the risk assessment. Exactly. And I've seen people get flat punched in the face and everything. I've seen the victim of the racist actions get even more hurt because some are at came and escalate the situation. I was wondering, like, if you have or if you've heard of any like serious case of someone just completely escalating the situation that didn't need to be escalated in terms of like race sexuals i would say i've definitely heard about it we talk about these cases a lot i was never present for one of them there's always cases of when a person just you know has it in their mind okay i have to stop this person and they have the right intentions they want to help but they they jump in and kind of go like hey you shouldn't be doing yeah. this you need to stop and it can escalate into violence it, it does happen yeah. and in those cases it sometimes just shows the person who was being racist that in their mind they were doing the right thing like because they you know they expected somebody to get violent they expected to show this and by acting in such a way, even with the right intentions, sometimes, unfortunately, you give them even more. I mean, exactly. Yeah. You give them a, a justification for their stuff. Like, I've seen people, like, uh, they, they make a racist comment, and then so, and then the people just, like, start yelling, and it's like, getting very aggressive. And now, in their muscles, they're the victim. Yeah. And the media, with the way they spin stuff, now the media will say that 
then they're the victim. Yeah. And actually they're the one that instigated it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but enough about me, how about you three? So what are some of your cases of, you know, being an ally or being in a situation where you saw something happen that somebody was an ally? Could you tell me about that? I remember being my, my little girl first time being an ally at the most specific time where I actually called someone out. But this is one of the weirdest stories. So uh, I was, I must have been 13 at the time. Like, so I went to a school that's a very, very white school. And we have, I think if we, in my time, my seven years at school, I think I saw about four people of color at like school. And one of them, uh, around when year nine, and when I was like 30, if I'm 40, he was a very close friend of mine. And and so what they did in our schools, because they all did the show how diverse we were. But we really weren't. Uh, so, so if they would select him and put him in like group, uh, school photos just to show the diverse. And now he, you check on the website, he's at almost every single sports team's photo. Oh, just there. But like the best one that I saw was when he, he, so he's a very small guy. I <laughs> just see him in the rugby team photo. Oh no, how <laughs> cool. With him. With these like massive guys. <laughs> he's just there like, he was like, that <laughs> token is a right so yeah. you know, have a long person of color and you're gonna put them everywhere to show it you have them but if you're in that person also she gets us yeah, we had a couple issues like with them because like we, we went to a like a very uh, rural school and it was quite out of the way and there a lot lost population that were farmers and uh when you, so the, so the stereotype of the farmers, they tend to not have the most open view. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got a couple of them that actually left up to that stereotype. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, he comes to me one day, he's like, oh, this, this guy, mm -hmm. he's being racist to me. I'm the, well, I was, yeah, like, I was there, I was like, oh, I'm not going to like let that happen to a crime, I'm going to confront it. So uh, he told me the guy was the year above. Like, so I was 13, he must have been about 14 then. So he, he says, oh, he, he says, tell me who it is. He's like, tell me who it is, and then I'll, I'll go speak to him. And uh, and this points to the guy out, and I go through like the class of brothers. He said, "You do not fourteen. Nah. You look like you had three kids in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, for you might be able to just get it. you look massive." I was like, hey, "I'm gonna get, I, I, I'm gonna say so he's gonna hit me." But yeah, I like confronted him. And he used a, he used a very unflight reaction, like, mm. like, like, you know the stereotype of, like, a guy just being so massive and laid, like, big muscles, small brains. This was it. Yeah. And, like, I, I confronted him about it, and then a, a loads of other people confronted him as well. Like, as soon as I start, it sort of changed the reaction, the people started getting more examples of him being racist. That was a good thing, like, when I called out, everyone else started calling him out as well. So that was like my first time that I remember like do something right essentially. Yeah. Oh. What about you guys? Do you guys have any examples? Um, last year I was working on a summer camp as uh, one of the counselors. Uh, it was uh, just a girls camp. It was like for gymnastics. And one of the girls there was uh, a person of color because like Pia said in Slovenia we don't have many. Men. Yeah. And the girls must have been 10 or less. Um, and one of the girls made a really mean racist comment to that uh, little girl and we called the parents and the parents said yeah it's okay so that was really like oh um and the thing that surprised us was that all of the other girls started like uh they attacked the girl that was being racist they educated her on why this is wrong that she should not do that and they made her apologize so basically you see little kids they don't care about it it's the way they were raised and so yeah yeah exactly so you, you see that it comes from an outside yeah and you see how uh, parents influence their kids so we had a kid in our in our youth club and he used to go around and he's showing the n-word quite loosely and he was about six years old. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. was the same day that I had it. Like, I was like, what? Like, yeah. and my voice is like, this is us. And then, I think it sounds, you know, like very, very um, 
raspy kind of yeah. or thing. <laughs> with smoke and yes. And in fact, we can't get rid of all of the fire that is in the You know, just as the other part of us like seeing Katy Perry too, Larry and Blake. Snows that while our projects are very educational, they're also very fun. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Fair. Yeah. Right? So learning about this stuff can, uh, should be, must be fun. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the, the Einstein events that, like, I've been to six now. Mm-hmm. And, well, like, each time it's such a unique but such a special experience. I met loads of friends on it. Like, me and Pierre now have known each other for too long. <laughs> yeah, too, too long, too long. Like we've been to too many events to get the town. Exactly. But that's also an IFM thing, connecting everybody from different cultures, different backgrounds, different whatever. And this is what also helps you be better, helps you be a better ally, helps you be a better person because you see people. You get to understand them. You're not reading about people. You're talking with them. You're exchanging your stories. You're, you're seeing how they live, how they see how you live, right? You know, that's why it's... It, these things help you in being more understanding, more open, being an ally. Just taking anti racist if you go back to the topic. You learn about so much stuff in such a different way. Mm-hmm. So obviously I was speaking to uh, all the participants here and he was telling me about the conflict at HRF. Mm-hmm. And, like, and you said the stuff I've never heard, like you. When you speak to someone from a different uh, country from you and a different culture and everything, you get a very, very deep insight to what's like something you can't learn mm. off the internet because, uh, and it is amazing. Like, I've met so many amazing people here and at these IFM events that I'm so glad are in my life because I made long lasting relationships with people. And I think that's one of the reasons, that's one of the main reasons why I love IFM because it brings people together from all over the world. Mm. Um, like, it's just turned into a very like IFM. Definitely, <laughs> building up IFM. Well, that's also good. It's also it's also nice. So, um, yeah. Any more questions you have? Is there any more questions? No. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's happy for Peter. Then happy. So yeah. So this is the second part of our interview, and this is Babakar, the uh, the uh, the last uh, intro president. Yeah. It was amazing. So can you explain a bit about yourself? Um, okay, I'm Babakar Mahamadou Toure. I'm from Mali. And uh, my member organization is Association de Pune de Mali. Um, professionally, I'm a teacher, teacher of English at the, the grammar schools. I'm currently the Africa Presidium member. And as you said, I have been like uh, the interim president for about uh 10 to 11 months so yeah is it so like how did you get into ifm or like your organization um i have been involved in my home organizations for years and years and it's like in 2015 because my mom my member my home organization has become member of ifmci in 2013 and it's like in um 2015 that I have personally started being involved, attending like a study session about human rights in Strasbourg in France. So from that year, I start uh, being engaged in IFM. So what was it like growing up in Mali compared to like the rest of Europe? Like what are the key differences? Growing from Mali and uh, growing from the rest of the world, it's like to me it could be the same just different on the realities on the ground because this is how the world is and um, i do believe and i do think that it's just the realities on the ground that makes things not uh, to be the same because like uh, because of the the geographical conditions and uh, also the education systems and also the the living conditions of people. This is like, to me, the only thing that can make the difference of uh, like growing in a country like Mali that is open to the desert, to the Sahara. And uh, the weather conditions are not at all favorable to the people. And uh, yeah, so to me, this is just what makes the difference. Otherwise, like people are enjoying their life the best they can and uh, this is all that's like in, in Europe and in the rest of the world, like 
yeah regarding when people now food education they are not priorities like in africa like these things are like priorities uh, for the time being when in europe these are not like priorities food is no more like a kind of priority in education system too so in africa mainly in a country like mines that is like 60 three years of independence because we are like a French colony. So, and uh, yeah, so this is what I can say at that level. Please, in, in Mali, is there many youth organizations like your own or is it, is there not m- m- much priority on youth education? Yeah, there are, there are many, many, many thousands of youth organizations in Mali because like, um, for example, what you have to understand is like, it's in 19... 19- 91 that we have started like uh, after a military coup that we come into the democratic process in Mali and uh, that democratic process opens the doors to the youth and the young organizations to be settled and implemented respecting the laws of the country just otherwise we have many young organizations and the youth led organizations in in Mali and uh, there is even a national youth council that is like an umbrella organization that put all these youth organizations together. That is called like uh, CNG Mali, it's like uh, the National Youth Council of, of Mali. So, yeah, but like um, the specifically about um, my home organization, the Pioneers of Mali, is just that we are almost the first child and the youth-led organization that has been settled in the country because we have been settled in the country in April the 21st, 1960. April the 21st, 1960, because like there was first like a scout movement in the country, but that scout movement, the first president, when we get our independence, because we get our independence in, 19, in September 22nd, 1960. So that scout movement was not like as inclusive and participative as the president, the first president was seeing it. And it was not like respecting like uh, the cultural diversity of the country. Then the president said that we need to set up a youth movement that goes in line with our own values. And that that will be inclusive, that will be participative. It's from that idea that we have come up with association. I mean, at first it was like movement, Mouvement National de Pune de Mali. Then later on in 1991, when the democracy has broke, uh, it becomes like an association so that like the political powers don't get um, profit from it because we are a non political organization and a non-profit organization so we don't want any like political organization to take a lead of our organization so it's up to the members of the organization to take lead of the organization instead of political powers because we stand for the whole citizens in the country and we know that once it becomes like political organizations the political power in place will take advantage from it instead of having the whole population taking advantage of it. Thank you. Yeah. And the, um, obviously through your organization you became the, through your organization you became the uh, interim uh, president of IFL. Mm. Uh, you've also you've been the president of your own organization, haven't you? Yeah. What was like what's like what's it like being the president like having this big responsibility of these big organizations on your shoulders? Like can you talk to us about like well, so the physical and the mental side of being a president of the, these organizations. I haven't yet been like a president yet of my home organization, but I'm like the local president of my my home district. And um, but like as you said, it's like very huge. It's like huge responsibility becoming like uh, or being in an international position and uh, mainly becoming like an interim president or like uh, uh, a whole regional like presidium member because uh, we have to know that in Africa we have eight member organizations coming from different areas like we have Senegal, we have Cameroon, we have Zimbabwe, we have like Egypt, so on and so forth. So it's like very huge in terms of responsibility. 
in the sense that you have to be constantly like in touch with those organizations and try to satisfy the best you can uh, the member organizations because we are here for that and uh, out of that it's like IFM is like an umbrella organization so we have different organizations doing different activities but for the same goal because they all have like child and the youth in the center in the core of their activities we have varieties of members but doing the same thing so you have to come and meet the needs of those varieties of the members it's tough but we are doing our best because like we know that like uh, when it comes from human it's never perfect but yeah but at the moment you also facilitate began that am I? so at the moment you're a facilitator for uh the choosing anti-racism project mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about sharing your own experiences as well do you have any experience that you're comfortable sharing where whether if you've witnessed or received or uh any races any actions or witness people be an ally and being successful is what i can say is like um personally since i have started being engaged in um i have them i haven't i can say that i have have personally directly been um targeted by something like that this makes the beauty of this movement personally to me that's why i i think that like everybody we should all continue struggling and doing what we are doing because of this beauty I have never felt the impression that I'm a stranger where the places I have moved to I got like that strong love that people are more worried about me than I'm worried about my 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 personal being and this is the beauty but I think it's uh what I do most of the time as an ally it's like going back when I can see that somebody is not maybe feeling comfortable like trying to go to by the person and try to see what checking the person if like everything is going well but the person and uh, maybe try to have like sometimes go for like psychological you know kind of advices letting people know this is like how i think we should act or we should behave that's that's all yeah and just one last question like why is ifm so important you know ifm is so important for me so far because since 2015 when i have started being fully engaged ifm has let me being more engaged at the international level ifm makes me connected to the rest of the world ifm empowered me you were talking about right now about the fact that i'm like facilitating activities I have started being first like a participant to different starting sessions is from the experience accruing that I get here and there that makes me become now like a facilitator in the different activities and I do think that you realize or you can witness what I'm doing on the ground so this is what makes me and I love the way people act in IFM and that's the beauty and we I'm part of like a socialist world and it's pretty important I think we should have just keep it perfect thank you Bawika for coming thank you for inviting me thank you thank you our powerful yeah, yeah.